So last Sunday, we all woke at different places. I uh, awoke at Shrinemont, and uh, while I heard the news of what had happened, it hadn't quite sunk in. There was no television, uh, and it was sort of just a, a little bit here and there of, 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 of the story. It wasn't until a day or so later. Uh, but we all woke up somehow affected by what had happened and the fact that it's not the first time. It, it may be the... Uh, the most violent of the attacks that have taken place. But even before then, we knew as a nation, we knew as a people that this has to end. We've got to figure out how. I think the part that, that cripples us is that we don't know. We really don't know how to keep this from happening. Uh, we don't know how to keep from losing faith. And so I can tell you from at least one person's perspective, all of my quick judgments about what we could do to solve this problem uh, have all failed uh, the, the, the test of, of continued scrutiny. It's difficult. There are so many different factors. But it's been painful to watch this particular time as we have witnessed what people can do to one another and a time where we need reconciliation, a time where we need hope, where we need an outpouring of love and care for one another, the realization that we need to love more deeply beyond all the things that, uh, that seem to stand in the way, uh, and yet it's become even more contentious. I got on Facebook and the threads uh, amongst people I thought were close friends uh, become more and more Words like idiot. Words like you're ignorant, you don't know what you're talking about. But really, it's really all of our best efforts to try to figure out how to end what we're doing to one another. But the divisions are not what we need. And this one seems to be that horrible, perfect storm of taking place amidst a time where we're already getting more polarized, that presidential campaign uh, that has us uh, just feeling the anxiety as a nation and, a, uh, a, a, and locally uh, of, of a country being divided. Uh, we have uh, uh, the Afghan-American uh, uh, who, who uh, attributed this uh, to his uh, allegiance to ISIS, which complicates things with the, uh, our, our, our relationship with our Muslim brothers and sisters in America uh, and, and, and abroad. Uh, it, the absolute hateful crimes uh, were, were, uh, were done to our, our, our LGBT brothers and sisters uh, and, uh, and have, have, have brought a myriad of, of, of how we care for one another to the surface uh, and, and politics around that as well. Uh, and it's just become a rather painful place to stand. But I think it's an important piece for us to work through. And one of the things uh, that, that Jesus does uh, is he demands to know the name of the, of, uh, of the demons that are possessing this man. Because when we name it, we can start talking about it and we can start uh, working our way through it and maybe come up with something that holds uh, and maybe at least understand each other a little bit more. I think we seek similar things. I think we seek security. And for some people, uh, that looks... Uh, like it's being threatened by the pervasiveness of guns in, in, in this world. And sometimes uh, the security is the fear of somebody else having one and being unable to defend yourself, the vulnerability that comes with not being able to protect yourself. Uh, but it's the same root fear uh, of, of our insecurity uh, of, 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 of being able to determine our own safety. I think sometimes uh, we're struggling with what we've lost as a nation. And for some, uh, it's, it's the threat to... Uh, to the way that life was, a simpler time, uh, a, a simpler age where, where the world just seemed to make more sense. Uh, and for some, it's the threat uh, against those, those principles of this being a place where people are welcomed uh, from uh, different creeds, different races, different places around the world, and that uh, wonderful idea of a melting pot. Uh, but we have similar anxieties and fears, uh, but yet uh, they seem to lead us to places of collision instead of places of unity. Uh, and I uh, am trying to figure out how to process. And I was very uh, heartened uh, with Bishop Johnson's response. As he said, he sat down to write his pastoral response uh, to the diocese. And he said each time he did, he would look at what he'd written, and he realized that's not right. And he'd do it again. He said that's not right. And he realized that, uh, that he had way too much anger in his heart 
uh, for him to be able to write what he needed to write, uh, to be able to provide hope, uh, to be able to provide a, a message that binds people together. Uh, and he said it wasn't until he could pray through that hate, through that anger uh, that, was in, uh, that was in his gut, that he was able to figure out what he needed to say. And I, I had another colleague who was trying to come up with a sermon uh, so that people could walk out the doors uh, with some sense of a way forward. And he said, you know, he again was blinded uh, by his anger and, and had to process that. How do you work through that to find a way that, uh, that we can be uh, people of hope? People of love, people who live out of that baptismal covenant that we will in just a few minutes proclaim where we seek and serve Christ in all people, where we respect the dignity of every human being. How do we be the church, the ambassadors of hope and love uh, in a world that's pulling at, its, at, uh, at itself? So I turn to the readings, and I think each one of these readings today has something that I hope uh, we can hold on to, uh, something that I think we need to hear. The first is, is from 1 Kings, uh, and I think it's very important to realize uh, what build up to this reading. Because sometimes, especially when we have our lectionary, we can pick out just the parts of the story that we want to tell, and we can leave the other part on the cutting room floor, uh, and we sometimes forget uh, that our story is not perfectly clean. The story that we have today is that uh, Elijah is being hunted by Jezebel, uh, but the reason he's being hunted is because that story we told a couple weeks ago, that, 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 that neat story about the, the, uh, the prophets of Baal, Baal uh, challenging uh, Elijah, or Elijah challenging them, and that they would, uh, they would create an altar, and that they would uh, have their sacrifice, and they would call on their gods to bring down fire, and whichever god brought down fire uh, was the true god. Uh, and the, the Baal set their altar, and they tried as they might. All the prophets circled around, and they called for their gods, and nothing happened. And then, uh, uh, and then Elijah set his altar, and uh, before he called on fire, he took all those jars of water, and he poured so much water on it that the trench around it filled. Uh, and then he calls upon his God, and it brings fire. And we realize that, uh, that his God is, um, is, is faithful and true. Uh, and that's where we end. But the rest of the story is that Elijah killed every one of the Baal prophets. And that's why Jezebel wants his head. He wants him to suffer like the prophets uh, that, he, that he had killed. Because they believe something different than he did. And I warn you. Us before we look at other people's uh, holy words, before we look at other people's faith uh, with a lens that's incomplete, uh, that that we have things in our story that we don't uh, that, that doesn't define us as Christians, doesn't define us as people, but they're in our book. And if somebody were to look quick, quickly through our book, they'd find other stories like that. Um, and I think I, I beg us uh, to be incredibly careful before we look at other people's texts, before we look at other people's faith. But as just as there are. 10,000 Christian denominations, uh, the rest of the world can't be painted uh, with any uh, narrower brush than we paint on them. Uh, and uh, also in that story from Kings, I invite you uh, to realize that Elijah is at his breaking point. He has lost hope. He is despondent. He is asking God to take his life. God says, I need you, and I'm not done with you. God feeds him, and then God says, get up. Go out of this cave and go and do the work I've called you to do. God says that to each one of us. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Get up, walk out of here, and do the work I've called you to do. I'm not done with you. And then we have our epistle for today. Uh, and as, as, as Paul is dealing with a church that's trying to figure out how to be the church, uh, and, and uh, before you had the label of Christianity, uh, you, had, you, had, you had Jews who followed Jesus, you had, you, had, you had Gentiles who followed Jesus, you had slaves who followed Jesus, and, and free people who followed Jesus, and, and conflict arose because we like these divisions and we create these divisions, and then we separate even farther based on these divisions. Uh, and Paul reminds us that Jesus hung on the cross for all of us, to bind all of us to himself, to take on all of our brokenness, all of our suffering, all of uh, the, the things we can do to one another, and he bore all of them so that we would all be one in Christ. And he calls us to lay down our divisions so that we can be the kind of body that we need to be. And I was at a funeral Friday, and Bishop Gulick was preaching, and uh, the, uh, the person that... Uh, that he was laying to rest was uh, his mother's best friend. Uh, his mother and father were best friends with, uh, uh, with the Greys. And uh, uh, he talked about the story of, of, of Ruth and Nell uh, uh, at a point where 
they weren't even speaking to each other. They, uh, they were on opposite sides of the political aisle and they had a falling out uh, and they kind of just decided they weren't going to be friends anymore. But he said, and he talked about how David Brooks writes about this, that, uh, that with the decline in the church, there aren't enough of these kind of communities that keep that from happening, that say, you can't say that you have no need of this person, uh, because the community keeps them together. The community keeps them accountable, whether they're on this side of the aisle or that side of the aisle, whether they believe this about this or that about that, whether they said this about this person. The community says, you can't disregard that person and continues to make them collide with each other until they figure out how to work through this. And that communities like this, communities that hold us accountable, that invite us to go shoulder to shoulder at the altar with people who think absolutely contrary to the way we think, challenge us and force us to continue and maintain that relationship. Here's another thing that I invite you to hold on to, that this community calls you into a body that celebrates our differences, that doesn't ask you to suspend them, uh, but it asks you to challenge your own self uh, and to listen to the other person and grow. And then finally, the gospel. We get to a gospel uh, that has Jesus crossing boundaries. This is the first time in Luke's gospel uh, that Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee to Gerasenes, and as he goes to the other side, uh, he is bridging a divide. He is not just going uh, to another Jewish town that understands his story, that understands the story, that informs his story. He's going uh, to a place that's so different. Uh, it's personified by the fact that they're, uh, um, that they're, herding, uh, they're herding pigs. Uh, just, to, just to make sure, we're absolutely sure this is a Gentile community that is apart from, uh, uh, from Jesus' hometown. When he arrives, there is a man possessed by demons. Uh, and I, I struggle with the idea of demons. I think, uh, especially given what well, we know about mental illness, I think it's a much clearer way to define it. And I think that's certainly uh, one of the things at play in, in all of these acts of violence, certainly in South Carolina and Sandy Hook and here. Uh, it, it's, it's mental illness. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a channel uh, that somebody who's deeply disturbed has fallen into. Uh, and I think that we have to acknowledge that and uh, certainly uh, and invite us to use all those God-given gifts that we know to, to combat mental illness. But I do think there are demons circling around uh, how we've responded to it. And I think we'll see it farther into this gospel story as well. Uh, so this person uh, has been so... Uh, 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 possessed that he's outside of the, the town. He's been shackled time and time again. He has no clothes. Uh, he is outside of any community, and their hope is just that he doesn't continue to break the chains uh, and, and, and threaten his people. Uh, and Jesus comes, and he calls uh, out, and he names, uh, uh, he names the legion of, uh, of demons within him. Uh, they beg to be thrown into the, uh, uh, to the, to the pigs. Uh, Jesus does so, and then he, and, and then he, and takes all of the pigs uh, off the side of the cliff, uh, and, and so visibly they all realize uh, that this man is no longer possessed. What an incredible miracle Jesus does. He takes somebody who has been so, not just, uh, not just demented by all of these things inside his head, but also totally separated from the, his community, and he, and he brings it back into the, into the fold. And as they go back and tell uh, people about it, and they come back, uh, what's their response? Fear. Times is that our response? We see a way forward. We see an image of who God is and what God promises us and, uh, and what God calls us to do, but our fear cripples us. Our fear keeps us from letting go uh, and trusting Him. And we see a God who crossed waters to come and crossed traditions uh, and cultures to come and show God's love and God's power and God's grace uh, to a people, and they respond in fear and reject uh, the healing that could take place. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, those are the demons that really are part of the story. Those are the demons that are part of our story, our desire for security that was never promised us. Security is not a promise that we have. Uh, our fear, and when we give into that fear, when we give into our, angry, our anger and our hatred, when we give into all of those things, those are the demons uh, that, that possess us. And I go back to Shannon uh, Bishop Johnson's uh, comments. What he had to do before he could respond uh, was to pray those things through. Pray arm in arm with the person next to us. Pray in the, the quiet of our own house. Pray that our hearts might be emptied of all of those things that poison us so that we could be ambassadors of hope, so that we could be people who cross over the Sea of Galilee to those who look different, act different, so that we can listen and not need to be right. So that we can hear other people's story and 
so that we can realize all of those truths that we'll proclaim in just a minute, that we are all God's beloved, that we can seek and serve Christ in all people, that we can respect the dignity of every human being, that we can be the church, that we can listen when God says, I'm not done with you, get up and walk out those doors and do the work that God's called us to be. Share that hope with the world. Amen.